dear students welcome back today we will discuss the political philosophy of thomas hobbes the great and perhaps the first modern political philosopher coming from england this is second in my video series on modern political thought if you are following we have discussed rousseau and now we'll see how drastically different hobbes ideas and conception of a state of nature social contract and political obligations are from rousseau and then we'll finally see locke and this all are from examination point of view so we'll discuss also the questions so let us begin dear students all philosopher speaks of their time and their thought are inscription of the life they live the people with whom they become friend and all the circumstances which shape their life this is the reason we study life and time of philosophers and same is with hobbes thomas hobbes was born in 1588 in a small town called malmesbury in england so most of his writings came in the mid of 17th century like 1650s or so 1651 was the time when most productive so some more than 350 years you can think those were very turbulent times in england there was civil war never such bloody civil war occurred after that in england 1642 to 51 war with spain when he uh, uh, when he uh, his birth was there the war with spain was going on he was a premature child his father abandoned his family so you can understand so he was from lower middle class and 30 years uh, uh, he um, war was in europe thereafter the westphalian treaty came and there were also religious wars so you can see that war and and conflict and religious conflict and europe in, in fact in turmoil england in civil war so that kind of uh, uh, very conflictual or adversarial uh, and chaotic type of uh, uh, environment was there in which uh, thoms was living and this uh, put an imprint on his thought process also he tutored royal family such as cavendish uh, who, who became earl of devonshire and also a young charles ii who became future king of england uh, studied he studied himself at Ax uh, oxford he toured europe with these royal family and otherwise also extensively he was in, in a bit of exile also um, to escape from the wrath of the powers to be in um, europe in italy and france and other uh, countries and he came in contact with great scientists of those time like galileo kepler descartes and and he was very much fascinated by the law of mechanics of newtonian mechanics matter in motion and he himself was an, um, a very expert kind of optical scientist and he developed a kind of faith in natural science and particularly matter in motion and his ability to explain even human psychology human behavior and political phenomena everything every social phenomena uh, from the cause and effect uh, cause and effect relationship learned from the methods of natural science particularly matter in motion and th this was a very interesting way of analyzing human behavior some 350 years back that's why he is called first modern political scientist he was founder of political science you can say his main contribution if we uh, see in 1642 die sive on the citizen or written in latin uh, de corpore on the body and 1655 de homine means human uh, the element of uh, law nature natural and politic came in 1750 sorry it is it should be 1650 1651 came the greatest his greatest creation that is leviathan his seminal creation on which this entire video is based his moral and political philosophy created uneasiness to the power of that time from all factions believe uh, not only the royalist uh, on whose side many believe that he was because of his um, uh, conception of ab absolute monarchy but even the parliamentarian were against his thought because of this absolute monarchy whereas monarchy and royalists were very much against him because there was traces of a revolution and resistance against monarchy in his 
writing. Also, he cut the monarch to the level of uh, ordinary human being by saying that both are nothing but matter and motion. They all are same. And there is no moral or divine right of uh, rule, but it was based on a social contract. So uh, his um, thought at that time was so revolutionary that he became enemy of almost all kind of belief. And that's why he had to took exile also. He was a very dark, gloomy kind of person. Nobody liked him that much. Even today, he is not uh, remembered the way Rousseau is remembered or even Locke is remembered. Many called him the monster of Malmesbury at that time because of his dark, gloomy, negative kind of thought process. So we'll see uh, how it all shaped uh, the way he explained the nature of man, state of nature, and then his social contract and how much it is different from other social contracting theory. If we see in a very nutshell, I am beginning by giving you the summary of his thought. Uh, entire world is mechanistic because he believed in matter in motion. So every worldly phenomena he had the belief, including the political, can be explained by the natural law of science, by the series of cause and effect, cause and effect like that. He had the belief and he tried honestly. Human condition without any political authority was of perpetual fear and constant war of all against all. This is because the condition of a human without any political authority, not inherently that human are wicked or, or they, are, um, they, they are bad or they, they are evil. In a way, it is, his nature is not in his control because he's guided by matter and emotions and emotions are nothing but the, the response of those emotions. And when there is no uh, overall power to educate, when everyone is judge of himself or herself, then this situation will occur in his view. So such poor, nasty, brutish, brutish life in a state of nature was due to, as I told, nature of the man and absence of any greater power to maintain peace and security. So guided by natural laws based on reason, they came out of the state of nature by a contract with one and all, wherein everyone surrendered their natural rights and power and will to a third party who was not party to that contract. He called it Leviathan, the state, government, the sovereign, the commonwealth, the will of people, you can say everything you, it represented that sovereign, they vested their power and right in that so that the sovereign became absolute, his power became absolute, unlimited, undivided, unalienable, and his duty was the sovereign was obliged to secure life, protect life and property and maintain peace and security of the people and people were obliged to obey the law and dictate of the sovereign. So this was in nutshell his political philosophy. Now we'll try to understand Hobbes' political philosophy by understanding the following. When, when we saw the overall summary, now we'll see the nature of man and then state of nature, of course, then his social contract as solution to come out of the state of nature. Before even social contract, we'll try to understand the natural laws on which the social contract is based. Then we'll uh, uh, some, some more discuss uh, his uh, theory of political obligation, why should be obey the law, and then significance of Hobbes political philosophy, and finally, the critic of Hobbes thought. So th this is the uh, repertoire uh, which is, is stored in, in next slides. If we see the nature of man, uh, as I told you that he believed that every human being or every creature is nothing but matter in motion. He discarded completely anything which is not matter, like thought or idea or separation of body and brain. It didn't matter for him. What matter was matter in motion. And for him, the emotions or passions or desire are the outcome of different kind of matter in motion. He identified two kinds of motion, vital and voluntary, which we know vital is all like heart, blood circulation, our involuntary um, motions in the body, um, like lungs and like nerves and all, which uh, sustain life uh, for him. And it is true scientifically that we are alive till our vital motions are there. And voluntary motions are 
in response to the external stimulus which uh, um, sends the masses to brain and then our hands and legs and other motions are there so what he derived from this that the basic human attribute is desire or you can say passion and that desire is of two type one he called appetite means liking another is disliking he called aversion so and these two desires are guided by different kind of motions so appetite in his view is when external stimulus support vital motion then we like something for example if we see very near and dear our very good friend so our heartbeat becomes good in his view our, our brain uh, motion in our nerves are, are supporting our vital motion in the same way like we are seeing uh, a snake then our heartbeat is very fast and our nerve motions are disturbed so such external stimulus which disturb vital motions are do they create aversion in human mind so appetite and aversion he explained in um, in response to um, what kind of uh, whether it is supporting or it is disturbing vital motion what kind of stimulus uh, that entity create for which we develop appetite or aversion then man's actions are not guided by intellect or reason but mainly by their appetite desire and passion and then this is scientifically people uh, scientists social scientists are now accepting that most of our decisions are not rational but taken by impulse and appetite desire and passion so he identified this 350 years before almost equal natural ability human possesses no one is invulnerable nor can expect to be able to dominate the others in nature uh, naturally some will have some um, physical uh, abilities more than others but other will have mental ability so it even out and that's why uh, nobody is having so much great power that he can dominate all and he cannot be killed by others or neither uh, anybody is not invulnerable and that create a environment of suspicion and fear for self life so he said that the will to survive that is self preservation and glory that uh, you can you can say the respect and recognition the expectation that people respect you and you are highly recognized of your worth that is glory are the chief appetites or desires and these two the will to serve or survival and glory is possible only by acquisition of power because power is the mean means to satisfy man desires so and how he defined happiness then we'll see that how the lust for power um, goes on happiness in his view is continuous progress of desire from one object to another a restless and perpetual desire for more power and more power till people vital motions are quiet and he's dead so uh, power is the means to um, satisfy to have pleasure so man wants to acquire more and more power but others also want to acquire similar power nobody stops them in nature so there will be a conflict of competition and because there is mistrust and fear because nobody is invulnerable so second problem will come that people will think that i will be killed by some others so why not to kill them before so this create a kind of condition for war man hold high opinion of themselves their self-worth and their sense of judgment uh, in his view we always inflate these all things and that uh, and create another kind of conflictual situation and in his view there is a moral relativism means the concept of good or bad or evil it depends on how human a individual thinks whether something pleases and delightful to him or it displeases in first case he will say that it is good when it displeases it is bad for him so it's a every man's moral judgment is contextual to his own pleasure or pain but man possesses sense of reason also that is he understand logical connections he can see the cause and effect and this is the reason he 
understand the laws of nature that he should go for peace if it is possible he should surrender his rights if any all are surrendering to maintain common peace and security and he should behave in a way he want others to behave so this kind of sense of reason also man possesses so finally man develops as i told you competition for power resource and glory and fear and and suspicion about motives of other and this is the main uh, kind of condition in which war against all everyone is in war against everyone is a possibility so he says in state of nature that we'll see next so as uh, we discuss because of the nature of man and also the condition of no political authority or no super power to adjudicate dispute what will happen so it will be conflictual and it is like war of all against all so let us see so state of nature is a hypothetical imaginary condition of human life without any political order so there is no civil society no state government no civil law and because there is no society so there is no concept of sin nobody is doing anything which can be termed as sin or injustice because there is no law so no justice or injustice and there is no society no moral standard it is contextual that's why there is no immorality in the state of nature man are at liberty to do anything to preserve their life and everyone has this right so there is no limit to natural liberty of anybody and that means that there is actually no liberty because you cannot exercise that without any conflict or war with others and with in in absence of any uh, government there is private judgment each one is judge jury and executioner of his own case whenever dispute arises so you can understand what kind of condition it will lead to so three principal causes of conflict among men are competition for power and of course glory which makes them attack for the sake of reputation and third is mistrust and fear which moves them to attack others for fear of being attacked by them so this situation mistrust and fear that better kill than be killed is a typical situation of prisoner's dilemma of game theory on which psychology and computer scientists are working even today what it is in nutshell suppose two criminals thief are caught if they both confess uh, they they will get a kind of uh, five years suppose jail term if they don't confess both keep silence they will get only two years punishment and let off if one confess other keep silence then who confesses one year who who confesses only one year and who does not eight years so that is the worst kind of situation but what happens because there is a fear and mistrust that my other partner may confess and i will keep silence both confess and they both get 5 years jail term otherwise if they would have cooperated the outcome would have been better because they both would have kept silence and only got 2 years jail term so this is called prisoner's dilemma and many scientists psychologists say that hobbes state of nature Ref, uh, indicate towards prisoner dilemma on game theory type of still it is not established so that kind of uh, thinking was there in his uh, state of nature that game theory can be thought of like that situation like better kill than be killed every man is a enemy to every man so it is war of all against all in such adversarial situation and you can imagine that comfortable sociable civilized life is very much impossible in this situation there is there cannot be any industry no art culture business trade knowledge peace progress nothing is possible so a life of uh, peace and progress is not possible in a state of nature as per hobbes uh, so in his famous uh, quotation the life in state of nature is solitary poor nasty protis and shot so this is how a gloomy and dark and negative uh, way he thought of human nature as well as state of nature now before we discuss his conception of social contract uh, since it is based on laws of nature 
these law hobsay are neither universal moral values nor divine commands they are universal precepts or code based on sense of reason so anybody having some reason sense of reason and rationality will arrive on this law by just its reasoning by just its uh, consequentiality you can say not any moral or divine command and he postulated many laws i am giving only those relevant for our social his understanding his social contract one is the self preservation is the prime duty of human being not to do anything which is destructive to life takes away means to preserve life and omit which may preserve his life very obvious second is a kind of universal precept whatever you require that others do to you that you do to them very obvious and third is every person should be should seek peace wherever possible and safe to do so foregoing their rights if all others do same to have peace this is very important for social contract based on this only social contract is made and finally once you entered into a covenant maintain that performing of a covenant is just and not performing is unjust so his social contract is based on these laws of nature so now let us see how he thought of his social contract and please remember that he was the first modern scientist to employ or deploy this uh, device of social contract after him locke came and then many years after rousseau so how he used this um, thought process um a, a kind of intellectual device to understand that how people came out of a state of nature to form a political community and what was its form so this is social contract theory so man in nature state of nature came out of it by following laws of nature to perform agreement or a kind of covenant with one and all to form civil society and state and government they form a commonwealth with form a political community uh, which is a sense like a state or, or also constituted government by a contract imaginary contract or covenant people surrendered their natural rights and powers and will in exchange for common peace and security as per the uh, law of nature what we have seen just to seek peace common peace and security they transfer their rights will and power to a third party and mind it the third party was not party to this contract or covenant so you can hop say you take it like third party is an artificial man mortal god you call it sovereign you call it commonwealth or the state the leviathan leviathan is a biblical a kind of sea monster having enormous power because he all power rights of all its people are vested in the sovereign so here is the famous picture of the leviathan you can see coming out of sea and having great power and in this um, because it is pixelated but his whole body is constituted of individual those, those are the people who entered into the contract so this is the image of leviathan you can think of and duty of the sovereign is what to maintain peace and security protect life and property not only protect from one another but from external threat so this is the bounden duty of the sovereign what is his right all rights of sovereignty do whatsoever to maintain peace and security raise taxes make laws imprison anybody declare war declare peace make road industry and everything trade whatever to maintain peace and security what is the duty of citizen to obey the laws and dictates of the sovereign this is the bounden duty this is the political obligation of Ob citizens are obliged to do as per the covenant and what are the rights of citizen right of self preservation that that is an alienable they are not leaving it even after this covenant and right to do anything as law of sovereign says or anything on which law is silent so you are free to live your life as per your wishes 
if it is as per law or on that law is silent. So that is the rights of citizen. If we see the features of social contract, it will make you uh, some uh, more clarity on his conception. The third party, I am repeating, the sovereign is not the party to the contract. And since he is not the party, he is not bound by any law. Even the law of sovereign is not applicable on the sovereign. And he is answerable to none. The third party, the sovereign, can be a person, monarch, he preferred that. But for him, it doesn't matter. He can be a council, a group of people like oligarchy or any other form. It doesn't matter. What matters is that all power, all rights are vested in the sovereign and whose power is absolute, unlimited, undivided, unalienable. He did not believe in separation of power as other uh, philosophers say. He, he did not, like Montesquieu and other, he did not believe in that. Um, he even did not believe that church and state are separate. He told that church come under the state and in laws of uh, civil law is applicable on even churches also. That was very controversial at that time. And in his view, um, nobody can take away um, any uh, power from sovereign and nobody ever the sovereign. There is no power ever made. One step process by which both society and state were created, it was different from John Locke's conception, where in a series of contracts, the first came the society, state, and then government. Here, in, at once, the society and state and government are created. He also um, uh, categorized sovereignty by institution and sovereignty by acquisition. The way social contract is done and sovereignty comes, it is by institution. People uh, themselves uh, then self constitute or institute the sovereignty and the political community. But suppose uh, a sovereign is defeated in war and some other power acquire that land, then the people of that land, as per Hobbes, uh, become subject or citizen to that sovereign. And this kind of contract where the new sovereign is obliged to protect life and property and the citizens which came under that sovereign are obliged to obey the law is a kind of sovereignty by acquisition. This can be very debatable that what kind of sovereignty this is. But he said that even contract or covenant done out of fear in this case is also uh, valid and, and it also constitute sovereignty. The contract is valid till the sovereign is able to maintain peace and security. This is very important. Means the moment a sovereign fails to protect you, you are free to revolt against him, not obey his law. So the contract fails and you are free. So this is the um, kind of condition the, on which the social contract is based, that sovereign will maintain peace and security, protect your life and property, your honor, your family, and you will obey the law of the sovereign and dictate of the sovereign. So, what we are discussing, we are continuing here, that why should we obey the law? Now, it should be very clear to you what we have discussed. It is only summarization in the slide. We are obliged to obey the law as per uh, Hobbes, uh, law of the sovereign, of course, because we consented at first place to have a sovereign. We made a contract, an agreement, a covenant, Hence, we are obliged to maintain the covenant. Law of nature says us that once we enter into an agreement or covenant, we need to maintain. This is just. This is justice. So we are bound by that covenant, and that says that we must obey the law of the sovereign. Then sovereign represents the will of the people, the commonwealth, the body politic of which each one is the creator of his own free will. We have ourselves created by our own free will. Hence, obeying the sovereign is our duty. This is again the law of the nature. Obeying law will maintain common peace and security. So there is an instrumental value also, prudential value also in obeying law. Because if each one is obeying law, then common peace and security will be maintained. Otherwise not. So, and... For this is the region why contract was performed at first place. 
So we must obey the law to maintain the outcome for which we entered into the covenant that is common peace and security. Not obeying law would be to break the contract and it is in sense returning to the state of nature in which the life would be even worse than obeying tough or even unjust law and even, even tolerating the tyranny of the uh, monarch or tyranny of the sovereign. He says that suppose sovereign is very cruel, but you just compare your life in a state of nature and you will find that this tyrannical sovereign is better than returning to that war of all against all. So you just tolerate to the point where you your life is in danger, your family, your honor is in danger, that we'll see what are those situations where you are um, obliged not to obey the law. So actions done to obey the law cannot be immoral or sin as the act is of the sovereign and not of the person carrying it. This was uh, directed towards Christian morality wherein people would have thought that suppose, uh, example, one executioner who is giving a hang, who is executing the hanging uh, to a, a prisoner, suppose he feel that I'm killing a person so it is sin in the eyes of God and my next life will be ruined. So he's just to save from this moral uh, uh, dilemma, he said that, a excuse, suppose an executioner is there, the same example, he is not killing that person. He is only carrying the act of the sovereign. The sovereign is killing that person. I am just doing mechanically without my own will. So I am not at all doing any immoral or sin act. So this is uh, very, should be very clear and it was to remove that dilemma of sin and immorality in the eyes of God. And then the final question comes when we are not obliged to obey the law. I have already given you the hint. When it comes to our self-defense, when the sovereign try to kill us not to maintain the common peace and security minded, not to preserve the sovereignty, but for other reason, when it comes to the protection of our family, protection of even our owner, he says, then we have the right not to obey the law. For example, he says that a soldier who is um, in warfare and the sovereignty is not at stake, then if it comes to his life, he is, um, he is free to flee from the war place. So it is just uh, to save his life. Same way, if uh, uh, you are being taken your life not through the procedure established by law, uh, in your view, then you are free to uh, register. That is very controversial. It becomes very controversial. Who will decide that whether it is just or unjust and like that. Then finally, he say uh, that uh, sovereign, when sovereign is not able to protect you, or maintain peace and security. Definitely at that time, you are not obliged to obey his law. So, so this became so controversial that he gave hint of political um, revolution against the monarch or the resistance. Um, so, so that um, uh, angered the power that be and he had to take, uh, he, he had to flee um, England and had to placate those powers just to return back. Okay, so this was the political obligation theory of Hobbes. Uh, now in final few slides, uh, we try to see what are the significance of Hobbes political philosophy. Students, we must appreciate that he was writing 350 years before. And at that time, there was the age of divine right of kings to rule. Uh, monarchy was ruling, no nothing of uh, democracy or political representation and equality between subject and the king was even thought of. At that time, he was first to deny scientifically that the notion of divine right of king to rule is wrong. There is no scientific base to that. Scientifically, he tried to prove the equality of a mere person, even beggar, to the king. Both are similar in nature like matter in motion. They are bundle of matter in motion and no different. So this kind of radical thought, 350 years before you can think what kind of thought he brought and what kind of 
uh, reactions he would it would have generated he was first to legitimize resistance or revolution against the ruler if he fails to perform his bounden duties of protection of life property he was a, a true individualist he put individual and his right in the center of political discourse he start from a abstract man his desire his passions and then think of the society and community as aggregation literally also of individuals in this way he is considered as grandfather of modern liberalism so he was the first modern social contract theory of origin of state and political obligation uh, of course before him um, in old time the classical greek and others roman even in india uh, uh, some kind of social contract theory we can think of in the thoughts of buddhas also but he was the first one to um, employ scientific uh, cause and effect methodology laws of natural science and mechanistic matter in motion and all kind of geometry and um, yes, uh, mathematical derivations to arrive at uh, the origin of a state by using this device of social contract so he was the first uh, scientific contractian social contractian theorist and philosopher he was the first modern political scientist in many ways you can understand because he explained he attempted to explain political phenomena according to scientific law of matter in motion scientific way of analyzing cause and effect and geometry he was the first modern political philosopher to secularize the state you see that he told that there is no separation of power between state and church and he told that civil law is applicable or church also you have seen that how he absorbed all citizen from divine or moral um, obligation because that act done to maintain sovereignty is the act of the sovereign not of the individual no sin no morality no divine order you can see that how he formulated the natural law not not on based on universal moral percepts or the divine command but as the outcome of the sense of reason so in all way he secularized the political discourse and also secularized the state and he was the unique combination of realism and idealism you can see that the morgenthau and other uh, would have inspired by his realist vision because this uh, international relation is nothing about but a state of nature uh, all there is no sovereign power so so that kind of realist view coming from him nature of man also how morgan topic is very much similar to how hobbes uh, postulated the nature of man also his materialism that everything is matter in motion but his idea of social contract is a utopic it is a great idealism so so it's a, he's a, a combination of realism and idealism so these are the significance of hobbes political philosophy you should write in your exam but there are many many critics of hobbes political philosophy also now we should uh, try to explain those first uh, his pessimistic view of human nature the dark negative kind of man and condition of a state of nature that the condition of war of all against all competition desire passion conflict everything is so gloomy sad and dark that uh, many feel that he only reflected the life he led life of conflict surrounding him as rousseau say that it's such a folly to a kind of imprint the current degenerated human nature because of the modern civilization to the nature living in the lap of the nature sorry human living in the lap of the nature rousseau say that whatever hobbes say about the human is what human have become after coming of the civilization not in the state of nature there was no basis of saying how hobbes gave a lot of many example so this is one of the most uh, uh, scathing critic of his thought the pessimistic view of human nature and condition of state of nature then second his idea of absolute rule attract lot of criticism 
it's a kind of bordering to totalitarianism because he says that even your normative belief can be dictated by the sovereign. So I, I, nobody can say that he was in any way um, you know, for democracy and liberalism is a antithesis of this kind of thought of absolute monarch and totalitarianism. But on the other hand, because he was so much individualist and so much thought of individual rights and individual uh, kind of liberty to individual and he he thought society as nothing but or even leviathan as nothing but bundle of individuals coming together surrendering or vesting their rights and power that's why he is called father of liberalism this is a contradiction of absolute rule and individual rights and but his excessive focus on individuals undermined the institutions of family kinship community society made him wonder but how he could not talk about the family? Was not there any bond between the children and the parents? Are not there any kind of social contract there, obligation of father towards or parents toward their children and duty of children toward their parent? What about the love and uh, kind of a, a, a contract, a tacit contract in kinship? What about the community? A rudimentary form even in a state of nature was there not any society no con uh, concept of morality sin or justice it is difficult because he did not consider anything but abstract man a individual his desire his passion everything even moral relativism limits up to the human border the individual's border so that that kind of um, thinking of deep indi individualist what macpherson say possessive individualism is uh, a, a, a scathing critic against his political thought. His obsession with materialism, that everything, even human, is a bundle of matter in motion, and his attempt to explain political phenomena by laws of natural science, though it was very novel and very uh, kind of curious kind of uh, attempt at that time, innovative attempt, but it, it, it attracted a lot of criticism. That, can be explained and in post behavioral phase of political uh, theory enterprise of theory making now it is accepted that human behavior cannot be explained by laws of the natural science so that was one demerit of his thought process though it was a very novel and nobody can deny his great attempt and honesty in doing so and his thought like any great philosopher is having a lot of paradox uh, individualism, as I told you, versus community in social contact. When individuals are anti-social, how they develop that kind of sense to come together uh, to have a great uh, uh, thought of having social contract for a political community and sovereignty, all of uh, a sudden how it is. Uh, then absolute rule versus right to revolution is also another uh, kind of paradox. Because of this, uh, both parliamentary and, and royalist became opposed to him and materialism versus idealism we have seen that being uh, truly a materialist but he thought of a social contract a kind of utopic thinking a idealism and he thought of reason that everything natural law is based on sense of reason but he also talks of morality his moral philosophy is also very important so these are the paradox in his thought uh, we should understand so finally, I have inverted the way I have been discussing. Uh, these are some of the questions in, asked in university exam in undergraduate on this topic. Uh, first, I have taken critically examine the views of Hobbes on a state of nature and the state we have already discussed in this video. I think you can write it. Question two is analyze Hobbes theory of social contract. We have discussed that and Hobbes is both individualist and absolutist discuss you may also be asked to uh, uh, to explain how he's the father of modern liberalism and his critique of his um, political philosophy also you may ask to explain his, the theory of political obligation of Hobbes that we have explained in detail 